This is Pet Life Radio. Let's talk pets. Welcome, welcome. You're here live this morning, here a little half hour later than normal with Dr. Jeff Where We're here on Pet Life Radio's Ask the Best with Dr. Jeff. As always, we're here for you. We're here for your pets. Answer any questions you may have, any problems you may be having, just some information. And I'm so easy to get a hold of. Uh, you can certainly get the good old fashioned way. Pick up the phone, toll free 877 385 8882. Once again, 877 385 8882. Better yet, you can join me here live on Pet Life Radio. Just go on to PetLifeRadio.com, click on Shows, scroll to Ask the Vet with Dr. Jeff, and you can click on the show, and there's a link left to you. It's a Zoom link, live. Be there with your pet. It's the kind of stuff you should get used to doing because with telemedicine now booming, this is how you start communicating with your veterinarian. It's that easy. You don't have to get into a car. You don't have to fight traffic. You don't have to park. You just can do it telemedicine, and it's fantastic. And I'm here once again. I want to welcome my Instagram audience. Anyway, as always, I like to kind of peruse the news, see what's going on in the vet world, the pet world, and kind of pass that information on to you. So if you have any specific questions, you can get a hold of me on Instagram. Basically, it's Werbs underscore DVM. Why Werbs? Because I, if you don't know, that's been my nickname literally since I was a kid in elementary school. I was always Werbs. My very first personalized license plate, PLP, when I got my car back in 1970, when I turned 16, was Werbs. And I actually still have the license plate. It's so funny. It's hitting, it's hanging in my garage. I have the original Werbs license plate. So a number of years ago, Brandon, my son, and who's a CEO at AirVet, who's, by the way, doing a bang up job. He got me Dr. Werbs to make me official. So uh, anyway, I guess now I'm official. You know, it's funny. I never introduce myself as Dr. Werb. It's always Dr. Jeff or usually just Jeff. So uh, it's so weird when I have, you know, here I am. I'm, I've never been sort of it's so impressed with the doctor in front of my name and, and my license plate, my nickname with Dr. Werbs in front of it. So anyway, perusing the news. And I always like to do that unless somebody wants to join me here live and we can deal with a problem right now with everybody here. So here's a 10 year old pug with um, no really eye problem, but wondering if it would be good to have some eye drops to keep her the moist as she gets older. Very interesting. So really that depends. I don't usually use eye drops prophylactically. If everything is in order with the eyes, that includes the regular tear ducts and still have the gland, the nictitans gland, which is the gland of the third eyelid. That's the one that if you've ever seen cherry eye, that's the gland that pops out. That actually serves as accessory tears when dogs get older. So if that is intact, and the dog is doing well otherwise, they probably don't need any accessory tears. I mean, it wouldn't hurt to do, but as long as their tear production is good. How do you tell? Uh, next time you go to your vet, make an appointment. It's called a Shermer tear test. We take these little strips, look like little litmus paper, and what you do is we put them right in the corner of the eye. We do one at a time. Some vets can do both at the same time, but I don't think dogs like it that much. So I like to do one at a time. Anyway, for one minute, you leave it in, play 60 seconds, and it there's like a blue dye. And as the tears are produced, they push the blue color forward. And as long as you have up to at least 15 millimeters per minute, the dog is fine. You don't need to supplement. If we have KCS, keratoconjunctivitis sicca, also known as dry eye, then absolutely. Uh, they're not only artificial tears would help, but there are some other things as well. There's some cyclosporin, a medication called Optimune, pilocarpine. These are meds that actually stimulate tear production. This, by the way, is the reason why back in the day when I graduated, the treatment for cherry eye was to remove the gland. But now we've learned that since that gland has accessory tear properties, many dogs, especially the Cocker Spaniels, that had their third, the gland of the third eye removed when they were puppies because of cherry eye, ended up with dry eye when they got older. Ah, maybe there's a link, you think? So exactly what it was. We've lost the accessory tear production given, produced by that gland because you removed it. And that's why nowadays we no longer remove the gland of the, of the third eyelid, the cherry eye. When dogs get it, we actually do a surgical procedure to tuck the gland down inside the nictitans, inside that third eyelid, and it preserves the gland, preserves the tear production, but it keeps that gland out of sight. So 
Great question. So any word on using turmeric for arthritis in dogs? I know that turmeric is being used. Again, it's, it's one of these things where you probably should talk to a naturopathic vet. Oh, go online. As long as you have a dose. I don't want to recommend anything where we don't really kind of know dose-wise what can happen if it's too much. You know, think about vitamins. The water side of vitamins B and C, you could use almost, you know, ad nauseum because whatever's left, they, they urinate out. Ha! Ha! But A, D, E, and K, which are the fat, you can actually use too much A or D or E or K and actually cause problem. So one needs to be careful with something that is, you know, a spice, something that we just don't know. It's not like commonplace. So therefore, I would check. But I do know that it is being used for different things and with success. Okay. So veterinarians continue to face high demand. Duh, don't you think? So I see this as a few reasons. Number one, people are staying home with more, their pets more. Uh, they started going back to work short time, and then the D variant, Delta variant came, and people are going back, staying home. So they're more likely to spot problems in their pets when they didn't notice them because they were gone for so many hours during the day. Obviously, pet adoptions rose. Now, even though there are a fair number of pets, fortunately not tremendous number, that maybe 30 to 35%, one of the rescues I spoke to, are being returned, relinquished, because of now there is a sort of a, that movement going back to the workplace. Now these dogs are left alone. They're destructive because when they were there, we really created this mess because when you were home and the dogs were home, all right, and maybe if you had no kids and they were older doing their own thing or they were on, sitting on their computers or Zoom all day long, right, you were stuck playing with the dog. So the dog, not only did it come into a new home, which is really great, but it got used to that routine. And then you go back to work. And now the dog is sitting there twiddling its thumbs. Of course, it's paws. What do we do now? And they become destructive. They, they vocalize. They, they chew. And part of that problem is, and that's why a lot of the behaviors say, when you have and you're trying to beat this separation anxiety, you want to eliminate the routines. You want to keep your dog guessing. So they don't get used to any one thing. And even when you're home, you, they have to have time alone. And when you get up, when you leave the room, they have to stay. Come and go at different times during the day, even if you just go to take a walk, just so they don't get used to being the same routine all the time. Because when that routine is broken, that's when the anxiety sets in. And the third reason that is obviously nearest and dearest to me, because I see it all the time, and it drives me bonkers. And that's the way the veterinarians implementing stringent infection control, which I, I get that, but their protocols I disagree with, and very, very inefficient curbside. And that is where the problem lies tremendously. That's why they can't handle load. Not because they're seeing five more dogs a day. It's because they have to see 15 or 20 because they're only seeing one every hour almost. And so instead of seeing two, three an hour and seeing 35 in a day, they're seeing 15 or less. And that is the problem. And it's because of poor curbside practices, because they're having you sit in a car, you can't go in, you can't engage. If I was here with you now, and I had your pet on my desk, all right, in my home office, and I was looking with you right there watching everything, and we talking, having the exchange as if you were in the exam room with me, it would be a different ballgame. But what's happening is you're sitting in a car, twiddling your thumbs and not letting you in, forget the fact how impersonal it is, and I think unprofessional. Can you imagine a mom, right? I said this, I think last week before going to a doctor's office with your new infant, congratulations on the new baby. Oh, by the way, we're going to take the baby away from you for the next hour. You're going to sit here and wait. That's not going to happen. And so why should it happen with our pets? So therein lies the problem. All right, hookworms. Uh, now the third medication <laughs> that used to work is not working. So basically right now for dogs, there is no FDA approved medication for hookworms. And we see hookworms in the South. That's terrible. Now, there is a new, I think, uh, University of Georgia uh, has been working on a new product that is now FDA approved for cats, but not yet for dogs. So just whatever you do, don't let your dog get hookworm disease. Uh, you know, you got to do, do a fecal check. Watch out when they go to the dog park. You know, some areas, municipalities, it's more common, more frequent than others. But, but be careful because there's really no good treatment out there. So why should you avoid startling a dog? This is an interesting statistic. You realize that 4.5 million people were bitten by dogs last year, and about 800,000 of them, significant enough, to, like, so it's about a fifth to get treatment, to get to seek medical attention. And, um, and understand that even friendly dogs can bite. 
I mean, my, one of my little dogs, he, he was startled. Some guy, I'm telling you, surprised the heck out of me because he's a lover. He's one of my rescue dogs. And we were walking, oh, we have five, we're walking them. And some guy didn't like go wide. If you come on, if you're walking by a pack of dogs that you don't know, you're not going to try to just scoop right through the pack, you idiot. No. So you go around, you say, hello, excuse me, hello, dog, something. And he tried to just go right along, right alongside and scared the crap out of one of my little dogs, little Harry, and Harry nipped him right on the leg. I'm not happy about it, I wasn't. And fortunately, he didn't break any skin uh, or even tear the pants. But the fact that even a sweet dog, and Harry, I'll tell you, is so sweet. You come over the house, he will jump on you, he will give you kisses, but he was startled. So that, it just goes to show it can happen. So the most important thing to do is that, you know, know that if they're startled or in pain, even, and that's why I say when we have a dog, for example, that was hit by a car or had some sort of accident or in a dog fight, and we know the dog at the hospital, he's a good patient and we've seen him a lot before and he is a doll all the time. But even those dogs, you hit a spot where they were, they're hurting and yeah, oh, they'll, they'll bite. That's why if you noticed, if your dogs are never hit by a car, bring in one of the first things the vet's going to do, even if they know the dog is going to muzzle them because it's very, very common that these dogs, because of the pain, will bite. So first thing you have to do is you have to learn body language. Fortunately, doing this as long as I have, I am pretty good. Have I been bitten? Yes, of course I've been bitten. But it's the nature of the beast. It's a, you know, it's a, a hazard, occupational hazard. You're going to be a veterinarian. You're going to get bitten. In fact, I work on a case now had to do with the dog bite, and this veterinarian is suing a client. That, to me, is a little insane. Because if you're a veterinarian and you're going to walk into a room, right, and you get bitten. Now, whose fault is that? You should have known better. Did you ask? If you've never seen this client before, if you've never seen this dog before, don't you want to find out what he's like? I can read the body language. One of the times I was bitten, this was funny, and I told this to the attorney because I'm working as, a, as the expert witness. And I said, I said, I walk into a room, it's a little palm rate. Now, it was a big palm, but it was a palm. And it was kind of cute, all right? So I see, and I'm right away, you can sell the ear. It just looks so cute. And I'm sitting and petting, and I'm getting under the chin, and he's kind of leaning into me. I said, oh, this is, this is what I would expect. So now what do I do like an idiot? I don't know do this dog. I took my eyes off the dog, and now I'm talking to the owner. And all of a sudden, this dog, I must have hit a spot. <laughs> and he got me right on the hand. I have a little scar there. And then, but this is the, the kicker. The clincher is the guy says, oh, he does that sometimes. <laughs> Oh, don't you think it would have been nice to tell me that before he bit me? Like, doc, just be careful. Sometimes he nips. No, no. All right, so inside, I, I had to get a couple stitches. But inside, I'm laughing. I said, thanks a lot for telling me. But it does, you know, it does happen. But you want to, first of all, learn their body language. And that's something important to do. And then next is, you know, is when you're approaching them. And be careful when they're eating, when they're sleeping, or they're playing with a toy that is their favorite toy. You can't just go up. That's what I teach my grandkids. They want to go. They want to pet the dogs all the time. Fortunately, my dogs are great with them, but it doesn't take much. If that dog thinks that you're going to there and you're going to take his favorite toy or, or take his treat away from him, and they're going to get aggressive. So uh, something you want to keep in mind. Milk recall. A milk recall here in California, statewide. They serve raw milk. What does that mean? It's milk that's not pasteurized. And just like with raw diets, that was always my complaint, is that you're spinning a roulette wheel with that one. It, you can land on, on something, no problem, or it can land on a bad one, and it can hurt you. So whatever your passion is for and however you want to eat, that's not my business. But you will see more problems just scientifically in unpasteurized products than pasteurized. How they're pasteurized, that might be something to think about. Is it high pressure pasteurized? Is it heat pasteurized? Whatever it is, but it's a recall. It's called Valley Milk and it's their raw cow's milk. And they found in a number of samples, Campylobacter jejuni, and that is basically something that can, can cause some issues. And then when we come back, because we have to take our break. I, boy, I talk a lot. We are going to um, talk about what the dog's version of fingerprints. It's really cool. Don't go away. So, you know, I'm always perusing what's going on in the pet world and I attend all the pet conferences. I came across a company I really like called Carlson Pet Products. It's family owned, very affordable stuff, and they specialize in creating pet safety products to keep your pets, you know, happily protected from the puppy stage all the way through their senior years. And they have tons of products. They have pet pens and folded elevated pet beds. They have crates, pet gates, etc. And um, I love their portable pen. First of all, they're very lightweight. You can fold them up. They have a little carry bag for storing. So they're really 
is so convenient for you to use. You can use them for at home, you can use them for traveling, or let's say you're just heading someplace down the street and you want to keep them protected. I think it's great. So the pet pens come in two sizes. You have a six panel and an eight panel. And so basically you get ample room to explore and you can add also an attachable canopy. So it creates like a shaded area to protect them from the sun. So for more information, you can visit them at carlsonpetproducts.com. You'll get 25% off the order plus free shipping. If you use the promo code PETLIFE, that's P-E-T-L-I-F-E. You're going to love them. How many of you have pets? My hand's raised. Now think about how lucky you are to have such a sweet little pet in your life. And that pet is lucky to have you too. But unfortunately, there are countless pets out there that don't have a home to call their own. However, Bob's from Skechers is trying to change that. So we developed Bob's for dogs and cats to help pets in need. With every purchase of adorable Bob's footwear or fun, stylish apparel, or even the cutest Bob's pet accessories, Skechers makes a donation to Petco Love to help save shelter pets. And with your help, we've already saved the lives of over 1 million pets and raised over $7 million. So while you're getting style and comfort with features like Skechers' famous memory foam cushioning, you're also helping to save an adorable pet in need and helping another lucky owner be connected with a future best friend and companion. Because happiness is having a loving pet by your side. Find Bob's at a Skechers store, Skechers.com, select Petco locations, or wherever stylish footwear is sold. For those fortunate to have experienced the deep bond and unconditional love of a companion animal, the death that follows can be one of the most difficult and misunderstood losses to go through. Many times, this devastating loss goes unrecognized and trivialized by family and friends, leaving grieving pet parents struggling to find healthy ways to cope with the loss. In And I Love You Still, a thoughtful guide and remembrance journal for healing the loss of a pet, Dr. Julianne Corbin calls attention to the difficulties unique to the loss of a beloved pet and provides an interactive and compassionate guide to help you process your loss and work towards coming to a place of peace and healing. For those interested in journal therapy and looking for a professionally written and compassionate resource to help understand and reconcile the grief associated with the loss of your pet, this book is for you. And I Love You Still, a thoughtful guide and remembrance journal by Julianne Corbin is now available for purchase on Amazon and other major book retailers. Let's Talk Pets. Let's Talk Pets. On Pet Life Radio. Pet Life Radio. PetLifeRadio. PetLifeRadio.com. Okay, welcome back to her live with Dr. Jeff Werber here on Pet Life Radio's Ask the Vest with Dr. Jeff. And uh, so, before the break, I talked about uh, fingerprints. What is the dog version of fingerprints? What is unique? Every dog with that can actually do identification with this, and it all has to do, believe it or not, with their nose. Now, you know, first of all, we know how important a dog's nose is to them as far as their olfactory receptors. We have about 5 million. Dogs have about 250 million. Their nose is 50 times better than ours. It's amazing. But this is really cool. So they're all unique. Dogs have unique noses and they have their own version of nose prints. So basically, if you look up close to nose, there's some creases, there's some dots, there's some dimples in a nose. And not to mention also the size and shape of the nostrils. All of that combined, like if you took a mold, no two dogs are alike. So it's really cool how IDs, identifications can be made. So if there's a dog that's lost or something, or maybe, you know, in some sort of altercation, they say, you know, that's a nice way of saying like a a fight. And also there's something else going on. Speaking of that, in Louisville, in Louisville, Kentucky, or Louisville, they are now it's going before their local assembly. It's a mandate requiring all dogs and cats, all dogs and cats to be microchipped. And I think that's really good only because, well, for identification purposes, for legal issues. And also when you have a dog that's in, in, been in, they put in an altercation. That's a nice way of saying a fight or a dog attack. So if it's a dog to dog, they call it an altercation. It means probably a dog fight. If it's a dog to one of us, they call it a dog attack. You know, you say, oh, what happened? Oh, I got, I got a fight with a dog. I mean, it, uh, no, I was attacked by a dog. But that nostril light, that's really, really cool when you think about how unique. And do, do it at home. 
If you have, you know, hopefully you have more than one dog. If not, you can borrow one of mine just for the, just to see what this is like. I have five, but they are all different. And I think that's really cool. So this was also a very interesting technology and I, and I, I kind of liked it a lot. You've heard about 3D printing, all right? They have printing machines that print in three dimension. In fact, one of my clients was involved in that. They're making prostheses. They're doing so much stuff now with 3D printing. So here's really good. It's partial 3D printing. They print cartilage, all right? A cartilage implant that is made from advanced textiles seeded with autologous stem cells. Those are stem cells from the patient, him or herself, that you're making this implant for. And what it does, they implant this 3D cartilage made from your own stem cells or your dog's own stem cells. They implant it into the cartilaginous space of a bone, all right? And it has been proven to relieve pain with, in dogs with severe bone and joint disease like hip lesions, okay? And they're thinking that this technology, as they're running, so far there's some dogs that, that what they say, like four months out so far, and dramatic improvement and no rejection because the textile, the advanced textiles they use are non-reactive. There's, they can be sterilized. And the tissue is autologous stem cells from your own body, from the dog's own body. So there's no rejection. So, you know, something is sterile. The live cells are your own, the dog's own. And then they implant it inside the joint. So that really is fascinating. Obviously, already thinking of using this technology for people with severe joint disease. So when you think about the advancements when it comes to 3D printing, and now that, you know, used to use for external things, you know, casts and prostheses, et cetera. Now to be able to actually do internal inside the body, pretty soon they say that they're going to be able to take samples of tissue and 3D print it and make hearts, make livers. I mean, well, who was it? Someone said by, by the year, 20 years from now, people will be able to live way longer because they can, if you have a bad lung, they can, they can make a new one for you. They can do whatever it is uh, they'll be able to uh, make with 3D printing techniques as it grows, as the science grows, as the technology advances. That is amazingly cool. So, or maybe not. <laughs> who wants to be? You don't want to outlive everybody you are new. All of a sudden, you're, you're going to outlive your great-grandchildren. But that's no fun. So, uh, and one last thing about, you know, since we didn't have a lot of stuff about the COVID-19, though there was a story about two big cats at a zoo that, again, got it. You, that, those we hear. But we have our own little pandemic going on here in Southern California and maybe other places. And that is because of our taking over certain areas. We've kind of infringed their territory. And they, I mean, the coyotes, the skunks, the raccoons, the opossums, even wolves and deer. And that's why in many municipalities, we're seeing them sort of encroaching our areas. And with that comes their diseases. And leptospirosis is one of them. And, you know, there are many veterinarians that have never stopped giving the lepto vaccine. It comes part with a distemper parvo. They call it a DA2PL. The L is for lepto. Because Lepto was the one fraction that seemed to cause the most vaccine reactions. I don't mean really terrible hospitalized reactions, but dog is sluggish for a couple of days, maybe sore to the touch, et cetera. You don't want to get bitten, touching a sore spot. So I stopped using it unless the person frequented those areas where we see those animals. Well, now those animals are down in our areas. And I, I mean, I take my dogs out at night and, you know, raccoons and skunks are pretty nocturnal and literally I see them, if not every night, every second or third night. I'm going to see either a raccoon or a skunk. My dogs go nuts. My little French bulldog, he's a hunter, man. He's a hunter. And he, what's so amazing about him, he remembers every house that we saw a raccoon in or a skunk, and he goes nuts. Hey, they're not there anymore. But he stops, and he gets an alert, and he gets that stance, and he's ready to attack. And it's like, <laughs> Dwight, they're not there anymore. Leave them alone. But, uh, you know, it's amazing. The smell, the memory, however it is that he does it, it's kind of amazing. So, uh, and also influenza. And I, the reason I said earlier about the influenza is that there are a lot of doggy daycare facilities and grooming facilities, boarding facilities that will basically, when you make your reservation, they used to say, yeah, we require Bordetella. Now, many of them are requiring not just Bordetella, which is like a para influenza, it's a bacterium. And usually with the Bordetella shot comes a para influenza, 
vaccine. This is the influenza vaccine with the two new strains, H3 and 2, H3, which is newer, H3 and 8. And um, just know that you may have to do this. So there, now the requirements are growing. You always got to be spayed or neutered. You have to have these vaccines, the Bordetella, influenza, of course, rabies, and now leptospirosis. So check with your veterinarian, check with your local establishments, see what they are going to require and not, and make sure you are prepared. So that's all we have time for. Thanks for joining me here on this later half hour. Again, if you need to get a hold of me, uh, you can find me here on Pet Life Radio, just drjeff at petliferadio.com. And uh, I will see my messages. You can also get a hold of me on Instagram and just send me a, a message or on my cell. Uh, also, is always a good way to do it. And um, I will get back to you just as soon as I can. And of course, if you need some help with your pet and you can't get into your doctor, you choose not to go into your doctor, you're not sure if it's an emergency, go on to AirVet. You'll talk to one of our 3,000 vets or me. If you put me as your primary, register in Jeff's, J-E-F-F apostrophe S, telehospital, and we will be able to uh, talk online, virtually. I can see your pet. And as I always say, seeing is believing. You cannot describe something that I can see if I have a video. Picture's worth a thousand words. Live video, man, that's worth a hundred thousand words. So um, it's really is the wave of the future. So for those of you who did a, a request, I'm going to get back to you as soon as I sign off here. All right. All of you, thanks for joining me. Pet Life Radio. We'll see you here next week. Same time, same channel. If you have any questions, you can always reach me here at Pet Life Radio, Dr. Jeff at Pet Life Radio. And we'd love to have you live guests on the show anytime. So um, don't be bashful. Have a good week, everybody. And uh, well, thanks for joining me. We'll see you next week. Let's Talk Pets. Every week on demand, only on PetLifeRadio.com.